From God's heaven to a manger, from great riches to the poor, came the Holy Son of God, a little child. From the azure halls of heaven to a lowly manger stall, Jesus came and here he gave his life for Let's go. 
from the fall. Can we believe? Can we believe? We stood rejoicing to hear the sound of hallelujah ringing all around. We wondered then as we heard the song profound. Can we believe? Can we believe? and mighty. He is the one, the great Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. We saw him teaching on Jordan's shore. Such words of wisdom we've never heard before. The scoffer said he's just a man, he's nothing more. Yes, we believe. We heard the doubters as he was crucified. Say the resurrection was just a man-made lie. But to our hearts the cleansing blood has been applied. And we believe. Yes, we believe. He is the one, the great Messiah. Father God, we come to you this morning and we quiet our hearts, we still our minds. God, we expect to hear from you today. 
Lord, we just pray as we go through this service that this would be a service that would bring honor and glory to you, that we would hear your voice, that we would feel your presence, and God, most of all, that we would be changed. So Lord, we pray your blessing upon today. We pray your blessing upon this service. Father, be with each and every one of us here today, those who are here and those who can't make it. We just pray that today would be a day where we could reflect upon everything you've done for us. As we come into this Christmas season, we start thinking about you coming in, in babe form in a manger. We think about the amazing miracle that is. We just pray that as we think about that, that we would also remember, Lord, that you didn't stay in that manger, that you grew to be a man, you grew to be a man who loved the Father, that you grew to be a man who did many miracles, and ultimately gave your life for our sins, rose upon the cross, rose, rose out of the grave, and Lord, as, as you stand victorious today at the right hand of the Father, we just pray that as we worship you, we would remember that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 1 for a devotion. 1 John chapter 1. We live in a day and an age where people want evidence for everything. They want to know that something is true. They want tangible, physical reality that this is, is what it is and, and I can touch it, I can feel it, and I can know it. And uh, a few, well, it's probably been a couple weeks now, there was a trial going on, a pretty, pretty famous trial going on of the, uh, the man that drove his car through the parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. His trial was going, was going on and as I kind of caught glimpses and pieces of it to see what was going on and how it was going because I heard he represented himself. He didn't have a lawyer in the case. And I always wondered how you do that and how they can know the, the legal jargon and everything you need to know to, to represent yourself in court. But as he was trying to represent himself in court, he countlessly messed up the evidence. He didn't get the evidence right. He didn't get the presentation of the evidence right. And there was, there was things that he just didn't know how to, how to do, how to proceed with. And even the evidence that he had was sketchy. It wasn't real good evidence. And as I thought about that and as I think about where our society is today and, and their drive and their push to, to have evidence for everything, wanting to know what's true and basing it upon everything they can see and touch and feel. I got thinking about God's word and as we move into the Christmas season, you're going to hear more and more of that because people don't want to believe that it's about Jesus. They want something else that they can touch. They want presents, food, family. All these things that aren't bad in and of itself, but as we think about the Christmas season, as we think about Jesus coming, it is all about him. And no, we can't touch him right now physically. We can't see him physically. But is that where our evidence lies? In 1 John chapter 1, I want to read verses 1 through the first half of verse 3 and make some comments. John writes, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and we have heard, we proclaim also to you. John writing a series of evidence of why we can know that Jesus is real. Why we know that the word of God is truthful, that it's faithful, that it's not a fictitious book that was just fabricated by a bunch of men trying to get a, a cool story together so that they could start a religion. The word of God is true. Look at all these words of evidence, he says. That which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, we have touched with our hands, all talking about Jesus, he then moves on in verse 2. It says, we have seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim it to you. These are all words of evidence. John saw Jesus. John touched Jesus. His life was manifest. It was real to John. And because of that, John could write an accurate account of what he saw, of what he knew, of the things he experienced. And because of that, we can know and trust that it is true. That it is real. It's not just from a guy who thought of a cool guy named Jesus and figured this all out and wrote it all down. It was a man who experienced this. And he knew it was real. And what did that change? What's the benefits of all of this? 
Second half of verse 3 and verse 4 tell us. It says, So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And then verse 4, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. First half of verse, or second half of verse 3 and in verse 4 gives us three things that we can have, that we know that we can have by knowing the Word of God and by believing the Word of God. The first thing is fellowship with the church. Fellowship with the body of Christ. He says, so that you may too have fellowship with us. The worldwide body of Christ. And I don't know about you, but if you've done any traveling, and Deanna and I have had the privilege of traveling a little bit over the years, Going to different places and seeing different people. We were just in an in the airport uh, a couple months ago. And we were sitting in, in our seats. We got there very, very early. Um, I didn't even want to take a chance of missing our flight. So we got there very early. And we, we were sitting down. And it was just us and a couple other people in the terminal waiting for our flight. We had a couple hours to kill. And, and uh, we were just sitting there talking. And all of a sudden, the guy who was sitting in the seat behind us, his back was to us and our back was to him. We heard him with a, have a conversation. And you wonder sometimes when you're in an airport and it's busy and there's a lot of people, if you might be the only one there that is a Christian by some of the conversations, by some of the demeanors, the attitudes that they have. But as we sat there and we could hear this man, he was on the phone with his mother, and he was going through a whole series of scripture verses and different things that he was sharing with his mom and different things that he had been learning through the study of scripture and through his church. And we realized pretty quickly that we weren't alone. There were other Christians there. The, the worldwide body of Christ was present in that little terminal at Syracuse Airport. And that's a cool feeling. So you're part of the fellowship of the church. The second thing he says is that you're also in fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ. And, and that might be the biggest blessing of all. To know that you're in right relationship with Jesus and the Father. The one who can cleanse us of our sins. The one that can give us freedom in this life and in the life to come. We are in fellowship with him. And that's not just an uh, occasional communication with somebody. It's not a, a, an acquaintance you met and then forget about for a long time. It is a constant, intimate relationship. What a blessing. And then the third thing he says in verse 4 is that they're writing these things so that their joy may be complete. And we're going to hear that word joy an awful lot over the next four weeks as we go into the Christmas season. Joy to the world. These different words, that then you see these words plastered all over the place. Joy, peace. And as we look at them, what do they mean to us? Why are we joyful? Why do we have joy? Is it because we know that the word of God is true and that we know that Jesus was who he said he was? That we can trust him, that we can believe him, and that we can have life in him? I trust this morning as we go through our service that not only is just the word of God taught, but that each of us can apply it, but most of all that it changes us. Because that's what it can do. That's the joy of hearing and believing and trusting the Word of God as it changes our lives. It changes our trajectory, and it changes what we have hope in and where we get our joy. Let's pray again this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you so much for the fact that we can trust your Word, that there's evidence that it's true. We find evidence within your Word. We also find evidence outside of your Word, that it is accurate, that it's trustworthy, and that you wrote it. So, Father, this morning as we hear your word, and we're going to hear it a lot throughout the rest of today, I pray and I, I ask that we wouldn't just hear it and, and think of it as something good to, to know and to, to believe in, but something that can totally transform and change our lives because of the power that rests within it. And that power is not from the words that are in it, but by the author who wrote it. So, God, we just pray this morning that your power would rest upon your word and that each one of us would come away with a different perspective in a changed life because of your word. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask our... O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and be King of angels, O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. True God of true God. 
light of light eternal, our lowly nature he hath not abhorred. Son of the Father, begotten, not created, O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And if you'll stand with me and just look to your next page over at 95. <clears throat> O beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving the light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. O oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night, over the mountain till the break of dawn. And into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. O oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest, for the redeemed, the good and blessed. Older than glory when the crown is won. For Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory Dawn. Give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. 
Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Thank you. You may be seated.
precious moment coming back again. Messiah, Messiah, a baby boy, save us all. Messiah, Messiah. Good morning. It is good to be here with you this morning, and I trust that you have come to continue to hear what God has to say to us here this morning. Turn in your Bibles to the book of James chapter 4 to begin with this morning. The book of James chapter 4. We're going to look at this portion of Scripture, and then I have some other references, some other Scriptures we're going to look at this morning as well. James chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 10. James 4, beginning with verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I've titled the message this morning, Give Me, Give Me. Give Me, Give Me. We're in that time of year, that season of year, that sometimes that's the thought, that's the attitude of our hearts is give me, give me, if we're going to be real honest. Give me, give me. James is telling us here in these verses that when we have that kind of an attitude, (laughs) things don't go so well. Things don't go so well, depending on what it is that we want. I did a little research, and if, if you've ever looked at these at all, you'll find this very interesting. But if you've ever looked at pictures, pictures from the 1800s. They started taking pictures in the 1820s or 30s, somewhere in there. If you look at pictures from the 1800s, very few people had pictures taken. Very few. And almost in all of those pictures, if it was a wedding picture or if it was a a picture of just a single person or someone of nobility, the person is never smiling. Did you ever notice that? (laughs) They're in that picture and they just straight, just... Even on their wedding day, just no smile, just a picture. You want to move into the 1900s, started having color pictures, more animation in the pictures, right? So we began to get all kinds of pictures of scenery, beautiful sunsets and flowers and birds and all those kinds of things, much more animation. People began to smile in their pictures, not always, but more smiling. Today... What kind of pictures do we take? Selfies, right? (laughs) Selfies. We take selfies. We take pictures of ourselves. In fact, I found this very interesting. 
Uh, the research that I did said that, and this is their best guess from the, the things that they have accumulated and the research that they've done, that there are 92 million selfies taken daily throughout the world on all the devices. 92 million selfies every day. And just in case you're wondering, the average person takes 25,000 selfies in their lifetime. So I'm not sure where you're at. If you're a little behind schedule, you better get going. 25,000 selfies in your lifetime. Folks, we are consumed with ourselves, aren't we? We're consumed with ourselves. Give me, give me. Give me, give me. James here tells us that, that you know, these, these desires, these, the wars, the things that we have, the, you know, the, the consequences of this kind of an attitude, this give me, give me attitude, the consequences of that. We do not have, we cannot obtain, we fight and we war, he says in verse 2. We have these desires, we have these appetites, we have these, these lusts within us for personal gratification, and if we can't get what we want, then there's fights, then there's war, then there's quarrels, then there's all kinds of toil, you know, you know, stuff going on. Where does all that come from? It comes from that give-me-give-me give me attitude, whether we want to admit it or not. He also says in verses 2 and verse 3, we don't get what we really want. And we don't get what we really need. Because we're asking for things simply so we can have them for ourselves. Simply so that we can fulfill those desires and those things within us. That give me, give me attitude. He even goes to, so far as in, in verses 4 and 5 to say that, that give me attitude with, with the world, that world's give me attitude is actually enmity with God. It, it's exactly the opposite of serving God and following God. If I have that give me, give me attitude all about myself, I'm actually at enmity with God. Worldliness. Give me, give me. We're going to look at several different portions of Scripture here this morning because you'll find this attitude throughout the Scriptures. We're not the only ones who had this give me, give me attitude. Turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to look at a group of people who had a give me, give me attitude. 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 1 through 20. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. Scripture says, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, your sons do not walk in your ways, and here it is. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties and will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. 
He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of the city, Every man go to his city. Give me, give me attitude. They give me attitude of worldliness. Worldliness. I want what everybody else has. I want it because they have it. They have it, so I ought to have it. And Samuel shares several things with them. There's a lot of things in this passage. First of all, we see that Samuel was old and his sons were dishonest. He was old and his sons were dishonest. It was time for a change. Time for something different. But that didn't mean that they needed a king. (laughs) That didn't mean that they had to have what everybody else had. That simply meant that they needed to take care of what the problem was. But what did they ask for? Verse 4 and verse 5, give us a king. We want a king. A king to judge us just like all the other nations. And the Lord tells Samuel to warn the people. Tell them, what's this going to be like? You want a king? This is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to look like. And he shares all kinds of things with them. The things that these kings throughout history are going to do. They're going to take your sons. They're going to make them his slaves. They're going to follow his chariots. They're going to plow his fields. They're going to do all his work for him if you want a king. He's going to take your daughters. They're going to be in his harem. They're going to be perfumers. They're going to be bakers. They're going to be all these things. He's going to take a tenth of your goods, a tenth of your income, a tenth of all your stuff. If you want a king, this is what it's going to be like. And beyond that, at some point in time, he tells them that when you get to a point that you get sick of your king and you cry out to me, I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to hear you. But they continued on. Verse 19, they refused to obey the voice of Samuel. Again in verse 19, we will have a king. We will have a king. We want to be like all the nations. We will because we want to be like all the nations. We want this king to judge us. We want this king to go before us and fight our battles. They had a rich history. We've been studying that in our Sunday school lessons, how God had fought all of their battles for them. But they weren't content with that. Give me, give me. I want what they have. I want what all the nations have. I want what they have. I want to be like everybody else. So give me what everybody else has. I want to be like everybody else. That give me attitude of worldliness. That attitude sometimes creeps into our hearts and into our lives as well. I want what the world has. I want what the world is experiencing. I want what the world is, I want want to be like everybody else. Give me, give me. Turn ahead a few pages. We're looking at another one. 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. That was the attitude of the give me, give me attitude of worldliness. Here we find the give me, give me attitude of covetousness. The give me, give me attitude of covetousness. 1 Kings 21, verses 1 to 16. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. 
But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he, will, he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast, seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out, stone him, that he may die. So the men of the city, the elders and nobles, who were inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people, and two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city, stoned him with stones, so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up, went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Give me attitude of covetousness. Give me attitude of covetousness. He was asking for something that was not his. He was asking for something that did not belong to him. He was asking for something that should in no way, at no time, be in his possession. That plot of land, that vineyard belonged to him by, down through the generations. It was his father's inheritance down to him. It was not to be sold, not to be given, not to be, it stayed within the family. Ahab knew that, but it didn't matter to him. He wanted it. He wanted it. And it's interesting, in verse 4, he wanted it so bad, the things that he did. <laughs> he pouted. <laughs> he pouted. Pretty serious pouting going on there. He lay in his bed, he turned away his face, and he wouldn't eat. Now, it doesn't tell us how old Ahab was, but he was a grown man. And he was acting like a child. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands this morning, but <laughs> how many of us done the same thing? Something we just really wanted. Whether it was a, a thing or, or a position or a whatever. And when we didn't get it, we just kind of pouted. We pouted for a while. However, we did that. Maybe we didn't lay in our bed or turn our face or not eat, but we kind of pouted about that. Because we had that give me, give me attitude of covetousness. I wanted that and I didn't get that. So his wife goes on to take sort of control of the situation. She schemes to take possession of that, which should not have been theirs. And Ahab goes along with it. When he finds out everything that has happened, whether he knew everything that was happening or not, when it was all said and done, he just went and took possession of the land. Well, he's dead. I guess I'll take it. <laughs> he wanted it that bad. The name Jezebel itself means impudent, shameless, morally unrestrained. And the attitude, that, that attitude of covetousness is, is a, uh, an action, there, there's a spirit called the Jezebel spirit. It's alive and well in our world today. It's a single-minded determination to have one's own way no matter who is destroyed in the process. I want it, and I'm going to have it. And I don't care who stands in my way, I'm going to get it. That was Jezebel's attitude. I want it so bad that nothing, nothing and no one is going to stand in my way. Give me, give me. Give me, give me. 
Let's look at another one yet. New Testament will find the same attitude. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. This one may be a little more familiar. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13. Jesus here telling a parable. Luke 15, verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Here it is, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The give me attitude of selfishness. <laughs> selfishness. I just plain want it. I want to spend it on myself. It belongs to me. It rightfully belongs to me, and I want it now. I want it now. This younger son was tired of waiting. This, this portion would have been given to him at the proper time. His father would have done that. He would have divided his uh, earnings and his livelihood and everything they had. He would have divided it to his sons, his older son and younger son, when the time was right. The younger son couldn't wait. He was selfish. I want it now. I want it now. Give me attitude of selfishness. Tired of waiting, he forced his father's actions. The father, I'm sure, knew that this younger son was not ready for that responsibility, not ready for that kind of wealth, not ready to, to handle all of that. But yet he gave it. He divided his livelihood between the sons, between both of them. He didn't just give a portion to the younger son, he divided it between the two. And the older son would have got a double portion. So the older son got two-thirds of everything that the father had, the younger son got one-third. The younger son took one-third, that portion that he had gotten, he got it all together, whether he you know, got grain or got animals, whatever he needed to do to sort of put it all together, and he took off. And he wasted it on himself. Everything for himself. The give me attitude of selfishness, I want it, I can afford it, and I'm going to have it. Because I like it. And I'm going to enjoy it. Regardless. He lived totally for himself. The give me attitude of selfishness. But I want to look at one more yet this morning, so turn ahead just a little bit to the book of John. The book of John, chapter 4. Book of John, chapter 4. And I want to preface this by saying to you, that most times the give me, give me attitude is not a good, it's not a good place to be. But there is at least one time that the give me, give me attitude is right where we need to be. Right where we need to be. And that is we, if we have a give me attitude of humility or a give me attitude that comes out of humility. Recognizing what we truly need. John chapter 4 verses 1 to 15. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, and here it is, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Did she totally understand it all? I don't think so, but she understood enough. Jesus had something that she needed. And she was willing to reach out in humility and say to Jesus, give me. Give me. It was not a give me of worldliness. It was not a give me of covetousness. Not a give me of selfishness, but a recognition of her state in the sight of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Give me. Give me. Something that she would never thirst again. Something that would within her spring up to be a fountain of everlasting water, giving her everlasting life. And her response to that was, give me. Give me. What do we want this Christmas? What are we asking for this Christmas? Are there things that the world has that I, give me, give me? Are there things that I sort of have my eye on that I'm coveting that maybe neighbors have or someone else has, and I'm like, give me, give me. Maybe it's something I just want to do for myself because I kind of deserve that. I've earned that. Give me, give me. There is my attitude of my heart, an attitude of humility. Recognizing each and every day simply to cry out to God, give me, give me Jesus. Give me, give me Jesus. Because that's really all I need. I have a video, if Josh wants to get that ready here this morning. I want you to listen to this video, listen to the words. It speaks very well of what I'm trying to get across this morning. And I have a few more comments that I'd like to make when the video is done. Give me Give me Jesus.
see a proper give me, give me attitude is not wrong. If the attitude of my heart is give me Jesus. Just like the woman at the well, if you've never understood who Jesus is, never realized who he is, and he comes to you and, you, and, you, and you, the veil is torn from your eyes and you begin to understand who he is and what he has to offer you. The attitude of our hearts that he wants is that attitude that says, give me, give me. And for those who know, who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, to, to wake up every morning and to still have that yearning within our soul that says to Jesus, give me, <laughs> give me, give me compassion. Give me strength. Give me grace. Give me eyes to see. Give me. So my question this morning is, what give me attitude is in my heart this year? Is it a give me attitude of worldliness? A give me attitude of covetousness? A a give me attitude of selfishness? Or is it a give me attitude of humility? that says each and every day to Jesus, give me, give me. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning we're grateful to have a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, a God who continues to reach out to us, and a God who, if we humble ourselves, will always be there for us, to come into our hearts, come into our lives, to give us those things that we ask according to your will. And Father, it's my prayer this morning that if there are any here who do not have a personal relationship with you, who have recognized here this morning who you are, that you do love them, you do care for them, and God, that they would reach out to you and in humility say to you, give me, give me, give me Jesus, give me everlasting life. And if that is you here this morning, you can pray right where you are in your seat. Just simply cry out to Jesus. Cry out to God and say, give me Jesus. I need Jesus. Come. Come into my heart and into my life. I recognize I need you. And I give my life to you. Give me Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning and life has just been difficult. It's been tough. Or maybe there's circumstances that you're going through. You're just not sure which way to turn. And the yearning of your heart this morning in humility is that I can't face this alone. I can't go on by myself. And so your cry this morning is give me, give me Jesus. God, I pray your special touch upon each one of those here this morning. That they would sense your infilling, sense your touch right now at this moment. And that you would give them a special anointing, special presence with them here today. And Father, as well as the congregation, as we continue to move forward, we continue to reach out into our community and continue to just disciple those within this congregation. Lord, would you give us Jesus, give us more of Jesus, that we would see him, we would know him, we would follow him more and more each day. Father, again, thank you for this time together here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that not only today, but throughout the coming week and in the weeks ahead, Lord, the cry of our heart each day would be, give me Jesus. We'll praise you for that. We thank you for your blessings. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.